now, if you would, let me introduce you to my world record leg trap. Hey folks, do me a favor, practice CPR, check, photo and release. The future of vision is truly in your hands. Hi everyone, welcome to the night show. Hey, I gotta be perfectly honest with you. More than 3,000 people watched last week's show. Hey, I'm pretty proud of you folks. Really am. Hey, I'll tell you what we're going to do right now. We're going to lose these headphones. We don't need them. What we're going to talk about tonight is detailing. We're going to talk about the issues that really come to face each angler when you go to the water, and it's important that you understand what they mean to you. Now, that said, we're going to break things down tonight. Uh, I had, uh, over the weekend, just over the weekend alone, I had three different phone calls where I spent more than a half hour on each phone call explaining details, explaining how people headed north are going to find their fish. This happens again and again and again. My evenings are often loaded with folks who will call with a simple question and it evolves to a half hour seminar. And that's fine because that's what we're here for. But the truth of the matter is all of this stuff is out there. We've taught it again and again and again. So I sat down and started working on this week's show. And when I did, I had somebody come into the office and they were looking over my shoulders. I was working and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm working on the show. And she goes, you're crazy. You're, you're a fool. You're reinventing the wheel. Bob, you have this stuff. Go into the archives and find it. You have all of this stuff. So I stopped what I was doing and took a little different approach to it. Kevin Hartman got a hold of me uh, last week, mid last week, and he and his son were literally on the cell phone driving up north and we were talking about the variables, about what to look for, how to deal with them, what are the, the idiosyncrasies, if you will, what are the subject matters of importance when it comes to getting on fish as quickly as possible. And that's one of the things that prompted me to do this. The inbox has just been inundated at simply at, at fishing sticks. And remember that email address is bob.m at fishingstickstv.com. And these people are getting a hold of me saying, hey, we love the lure stuff. We love what you're talking. We love the format. We love everything you're doing. Keep it up. Don't stop what you're doing. Keep moving forward. And we'll help bring the audiences to you. So with that being said, I do want to make one more plead real quick. If you could, hit that little button down there that says share. Sharing is a big element, folks. Like I said, we went over 3,000 people that watched last week's show. And the reason for that is because there was some support out there. Some people came back and helped us out, let us share on their pages, even took it upon themselves to just share it on their own page themselves. And this is key because let's just say, for instance, I have 5,000 friends over on my personal page. If 1% of those people shared and that went to another 1% of people who shared on those pages, our growth would be astronomical. And that would really, really turn us up. So that being said, let's talk about the details, the important things that we're going to be doing. And um, as I said just a second ago, this is Fish and Steaks TV. Please help us grow. Follow us, like us, and share us. That's what it's all about. Before we get into tonight's show, I do want to tell you this. We talked last week about putting together a trip uh, into Canada, and it is been scheduled. So if you folks are listening or watching out there and you want to get involved with what we're doing, come on up and fish with us, uh, share roundtables at dinner, at breakfast. Uh, ain't going to be no lunch roundtable because we're not coming off the water. But those uh, breakfast and dinners, we share information. We'll tell you what we're doing, tell you how we're finding fish. We'll tell you what you need to know to be a better angler. And right now, we've got somewhere in the neighborhood of 18 to 20 people who want to join us at Witch Bay Camp in August of 2018. So that gives you an entire year to get prepared. And I want to see you guys load. Let's load the camp. Let's fill it up. Let's show what musky fishing is all about. That is a perfect time of the year. You have an enormous body of water. You have countless thousands of reefs and hundreds and hundreds of islands and points and all that stuff. Well, let's stop talking about those details because we're going to do it tonight here on the show. Just be prepared. 
August 18th or August in 2018. Get a hold of me and let's get fishing with, uh, let's get up there and go fishing at Witch Bay Camp. Let's do some musky hunting. Ooh, look at that. Oh, big fish. Oh, big fish. Is that over here? Is a 50 fish. Folks, <laughs> you're seeing it right now. My 100 just came in the net at Witch Bay Camp. Holy smokes, Rocky. He ate that thing. No matter the conditions or the type of water you're forced to fish, the muskie can be found if proper attention is given to specific details. That's right. I fear you can catch muskies with regularity by paying attention to tiny details. That is to say, choose your water and your structure carefully. Under every condition I know, you will find a window on a given piece of structure that allows you the opportunity to succeed in catching muskie. The size of the fish will be dependent on a few basic characteristics which we will define. Today we're going to focus our attention on what I call classic musky structure and identify areas of importance. Areas such as the crest, the spine, the food shelf, inside turns, points, flats, alleyways, and not to mention weed beds. To some people this may sound like an entire lake, but to an experienced musky hunter we're talking of an area commonly referred to as an isolated structure and may encompass only a few acres. The jackpot if you will. Which brings me yet to another subject matter, the proper choice of lures, jerk baits, crank baits, surface baits, and blade baits. They all have their time and place, and if you don't mind, I'll help you choose some appropriate lures depending on the conditions. Just hang on to her. Okay, I have to move the boat forward, because we're going to be on this reef here in a second, so just hang tight. Okay, it's fine. This rock here is one foot deep or less. You can see it's breaking right there on top of the bulrushes. If we don't get off this rock, hang on to her. She's okay. She's okay, but we have to get off that rock. If we don't, we're going to be in big trouble. Get off here so I can drift. That's the downside with fishing with the wind like this. Okay, what I'm going to do. I'm going to pull this up, that way if we get tight to it, we can drift right over it. Okay, what I need you to do is come this way with her. She's really not hooked that at all. Nice no, fish. She's still kind of green too. Nice fish. We had to do that or we'd be parking at 492 on the rocks. You don't want to do that? Me. No. Careful, Bob. Sweetheart. I'm okay. Doesn't help, uh... Pardon? The wind's blowing this strong. Okay, hang, hang tight. She's off. All right. See what I'm gonna do. Better? Hang tight to her. Hooks are replaceable. Yeah. Cut them out of the net. Once I get them out of the net, then I can lift her out. She's unhooked. She's fine right now. So yeah. Sitting just like she is. I'm not sweetheart. Okay, so my freeze pull is pushed, so when I lift her up, just take the net out of the way, okay? Yeah. Uh, that's what we came here for, huh? That's fish. Up here on top of that rock reef, 
there was a war zone to get her in this net. <laughs> no kidding. She came up, she missed that jackpot once, and she turned around, she came back down again. I'm gonna get her back, okay? Yeah. I'm gonna get a photo of the release. Nice thick fish. Look at that. There, on your left, you can almost see it. One of the most magnificent sights on the planet. Lake Athabasca nestled just below the 60th parallel. Lake Athabasca hasn't changed in nearly a thousand years with its pristine shorelines, pure crystal clear water you can actually drink, and countless fish. Boy has she got fish that is for everyone willing to travel to Other Side River Lodge. From the magnificent world class northern pike that prowl these waters to the oldest and biggest lakers on the globe, Athabasca has it all. Other Side River Lodge caters to the true sportsman seeking an all-American plan guided package with three incredible meals a day and memories you won't find anywhere else. Records have been broken by guests at Other Side River Lodge in the past. You could be next. Book your dream trip of a lifetime to Other Side River Lodge, where fishing dreams do come true. Call Cliff or Stella toll-free at 1-877-922-0957. Hey, I want to see a show of hands. How many guys we got going fishing on Lake of the Woods this year? Show of hands. Let me see. All right. How many are going to which bay? <laughs> well, folks, I want you to do this. I want you, when you get to which bay camp, now, this is something that people generally don't do, especially in my league of fishing. They just don't divulge where you're catching fish. And that's something I've done from day one. I've never hidden the camera shot. I've never tried to hide what we're doing or where we're doing it. In fact, is I tell you and have told you for decades where we fish, sometimes exactly where we fish. Al Linder told me one day, he said, Bob, I know what you're doing, and I, and I really think it's kind of cool but it's going to come back to bite you. There are just so many people that want to know exactly where you're fishing and they will go fish behind you. And I said, oh, that's what it's all about. It's all about getting somebody better acquainted to the water, making their effort, their trip, their expenditure, cash or otherwise, beneficial. So consequently, I went ahead and did it and I've done it every day. So when you guys get into Witch Bay, just go in and ask Steve or Gail. Hey, where's that reef they named after Bob Mesa Comer? If you ask that question, either one, Steve or Gail, is going to tell you about what you're going to see tonight. And I'm talking about being able to actually pull up and go over and fish the very spot, one of the spots that we're going to show you tonight. And it is a big fish spot, a very big fish spot. Uh, before I jump too far into the show, too, um, about 25 years ago, I guess it was, um, I was at the Chicago Sports Show, sat a big audience in the, in the big show in Chicago, and while I was up on stage prepared for my seminar, this lady comes up to me and she says, I want our name on your back. And I looked at her and I says, pardon me? She goes, I want our name on your back. I says, ma'am, who are you? And she says, I'm Sylvia James. Now, I didn't have a clue who Sylvia James was, but I later found out after my seminar when her son Mike came up to say hi. And who they were? They were Ranger Boats, folks. And I signed with Ranger Boats that year. And I became very good friends with Sylvia and Mike James. Now, Mike's unfortunately passed away, but Sylvia, she's still enjoying the sport, and she still goes to Witch Bay. And I used to share birthdays with Sylvia and I enjoyed them immensely. So let's catch up now as Sylvia and I, well, we just have a little fun musky fishing. Let's first look at the way in which a musky might use a piece of structure and what it means to us. Let's start with identifying the elements of our chosen structure. First, the crest or crown. This would be considered the highest submerged portion of the structure often found near the center, however, can exist anywhere on the structure. The spine. This is a very interesting part of the structure because of the magnetism to fish it exhibits. It almost acts as a super highway for the muskie. However, I have witnessed many fish using the spine that just won't respond to a lure, or at least a lure I was throwing at the time. 
Sometimes our presence is sensed by the commotion in and around our boats, and that alone will cause even the best lure to seem unproductive. So, if your choice is to fish on top of the structure, i.e. the crest, the crown, or the spine, it would be in your best interest to exhibit caution and be quiet. Points are pickup areas for any structure and without a doubt need careful consideration when sorting out structural elements. Inside turns are what I refer to as catch-all areas and later in this production I will explain this concept. The food shelf or dinner table as commonly referred to is a larger area offering attributes not found in other areas. Food shelves are commonly fished too fast and not often enough. You see muskies don't stay in this area very long. They enter, they do their business, and they exit just as quick. I consider them high percentage areas, but the conditions have to be right. Nothing stays on the food shelf for any length of time. How about fast vertical breaks? You bet. They also have their own set of attributes, none less important than the other. If we agree fast escape to deep water sanctuary is important, then you better learn how to read and use these areas. How about seasonal movements that depend on this type of structural element? Trust me, they exist. Today we will learn how to deal with them and use this knowledge to our benefit. And last but not least, vegetation, both emergent and submergent. A strong understanding of these two elements is a must for success. There's cabbage on the inside as we go up in here. I'm going to run us kind of fast. That last fish we just had really wanted a fast moving lure. But there's cabbage up here in front of us. There's a rock right out here. There's some of that red top that we call it up on top of it. And that's where we've been finding these fish. I've got this awaker on top so uh -huh. I can see pretty good. Good. This cabbage will hold fish all day long, but they won't come out of it until right before dark. I'll parallel it a little bit. Okay. Yeah, one more shot in here. We're out of here. You feel like that, you're fine. Good job, Sylvia. Good job. Would you like me to get my foot out of the net? You're okay. She came right out of there and ate you, didn't she? Mm -hmm. You want to bring it to the net? Mm -hmm. Should we hand grab her or net her? I don't, what do you say? Well, let's get a lot of hooks in there. We'll cut her out. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Sylvia, nice fish. <laughs> you did good, yeah, kid. Finally. You did yeah. good. It was great. It was fun. Great. Well, fun. we got some wind coming Thank in. You. They're forecasting some super wind for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So if that wind comes up, we're going to wish that we had more days like this. Nice fish, 45, 46 inches. Good I'm going to set her back in the water, though. Get her in there. You did good. Thanks. Good. I'm going to go this way. You did good. The crest or crown as defined earlier is the highest submerged portion of a structure. Okay, but how and when do you fish it? Upon examining the physical makeup of this element, one must first consider it a high activity spot. I often refer to it as a high percentage spot or an area in which the mood of the muskie would be at or near her peak if present. The problem with these areas is that they are what we term a spot on a spot. If you simply run onto a larger structure to fish the crest or the crown, you would surely spook off other muskies holding on this structure and thus limiting your possibility for success. In most cases, I would recommend you make long casts to cover these areas and avoid them until you have fished other key elements and can do so without forcing the fish to shut down or vacate the area. 
After all, it's hard enough to find a spot, not to mention one holding a fish. Muskies that use these areas will have to use many other areas in their attempt to achieve this destination. Expect to find the muskies using this area during the more extreme low light or inclement weather patterns, in other words, dusk and dead calm, to rolling and raining. The spine of the structure is in fact a superhighway to the crest or crown. However, it is not necessarily true that muskies using the spine will necessarily end up on the crest or the crown. There are often many other attributes relating to the spine that might stop and hold muskies during their adventures on the reef. Keep this in mind. Not only do muskies use the spine, other small fish or bait fish do as well, thus allowing the spine to collect or attract its own populations of forage for brief periods. Here again is a situation in which the structure will attract fish, but in reality does a poor job of holding them for any length of time. I have found over the years bigger fish like to use areas that create junctions rather than a straight spine. I have also noticed in the right conditions there will often be many users on the spine at any given time. Again, this is an area that almost requires long casts to be ultimately productive. One word of caution when scoping out this portion of the structure as well as the crown and the crest, be quiet. Big fish this high in the water column will not tolerate noise. Bring her back. Oh, hold tight, hold tight. Hi, everyone. Bob Mason over here. You know, I've got a place, a very, very special place in my heart. It's Osborne Bay. It's been excellent. Uh, Randy did a great job guiding service. Uh, Randy started taking us out when I was 10, and we've been catching big muskies ever since. The accommodations here are fantastic. Check out Century Lodge on Osborne Bay. Come on, bring her back. Like I said, folks, the lady is a perfect person to fish with. Sylvia James is an awesome, awesome individual. She goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with everything we do. Now, as we move on here, we're going to move into a little bit different part of the lake. We're going to move on to that superstructure. When I was talking to Kevin Hartman and Gene and another game named Ron over the weekend, there were a few elements that I was trying to explain to them to look for. What, what do you do? How do you pick a good piece of structure? And how do you know how to approach that piece of structure? We all know those bluebird days, folks, the days when you just, you're just almost never going to get bit. It can happen, but it's not a probable deal. That said, that's when I go research. That's when I go out and look at the areas I want to fish. The area that we're talking about today, well, before I get to the final piece here, I'll explain to you why we're here in the first place. But the truth of the matter is, when you learn these elements, all of these details that are on these little structures, man, you own them. You just own them. Now, when I shot this material, I had one huge advantage. I had a trolling motor called a pinpoint. And the pinpoint trolling motor, uh, Joe Martisesh, when Joe Martisesh made the pinpoint, he made the best trolling motor you could imagine because it allowed me to go out and depth track. I could go out and I could follow the contour that I wanted to follow. And as I would go around these superstructures, I would get a visual representation of what the reef was. I learned all the elements, and you could too. So as we went around it the first time, we took a half a dozen, maybe eight, ten marker buoys. And as we got out to the peak of each one of the little pinnacles on the reef itself, we marked it. We marked the peak, the inside turns, and that gave us a visual representation. Now we did this during bright sunny conditions, not during prime fishing. We didn't do it when we wanted to come up and get bit. We did it after we fished it. Even midday you have a probable chance. I mean it's not a great one, but you have a chance of getting bit. So we fished all the way around it, and then we went through the study the study side of it, if you will, the learning process. And when you learn these elements like this, you never forget them. Doc Engber, who's fished with me many times, said, you're the only person I know that can track these elements in your head and never forget them. Well, there's a lot of people who can, and there are people who are usually fishing ahead of the class. So with that being said, we're going to move on, and we're going to get on top of these structures, and we're going to learn more detail about what we're talking about. Attributes, conditions, and periods when one can expect a user. In most cases, I like to use points in very steady weather conditions or after the sun has been up for a while. 
If your point has submerged vegetation, it will not only be more productive, in most cases it will also hold fish longer. There's that H word, hold. That's right. The points are for the most part the first part of a structure that will actually hold muskies, allowing them to move on and off the main structure. This ability to ascend and descend while almost throwing caution to the wind makes for a prime, if not the prime, starting spot for your campaign of the mighty muskie. There are many things to be said for points. Some with long tapers. Others have fast oh, breaks, and even some God. have built-in saddles. And among the most believable would be their ability to produce within an incredible array of weather conditions, seasons, <laughs> and day parts. I have some favorite fish. points that to the that? untrained angler would this. seem downright unimpressive. But during very windy conditions, when the waves are blasting straight in, they can be unbelievable. Then there are those long points that are actually a deeper part of the spine, and oh boy, do they attract fish. The key here is to locate points that allow you a wide variety of successful conditions and be prepared to spend time hitting them. Steady weather conditions seem to be the most favorable. However, keep in mind, better points, by virtue of their physical makeup, offer huge windows of opportunity. How about those inside turns? Well, this is where we go when the conditions erode. You know, on the back side of a three-day cold front, you get the picture. This is in fact the best, or at least the first area I will seek out when I am forced to catch fish for the show and the weather conditions simply will not allow me the pleasure of fishing where and how I'd like. You can also be assured big, and I mean very big fish, use these areas regularly during adverse conditions. You can mark my words on it. These are not fish holding spots during the warmer periods of the season. However, when the old temperature starts to dive deeper than I care to fish, you know, that late fall period, you can bet these inside turns can outproduce any other part of your chosen structure. Probably the narrowest of all windows of opportunity during the summer patterns, however, also some of the most productive for big fish. If you believe, and I do, that ultimately the muskie's location is dependent on a hierarchy or a pecking order, then it's easy to reason that under extreme conditions the more superior predator will occupy the more favorable location. Whatever you do, don't overlook inside turns. Food shelves. The name itself implies the nature of the beast. Many fish can and will use these areas at the same time. But because of the abundance of food, they can give you the impression that they are not always actively feeding. These areas are notorious for attracting following fish. Large in comparison to the rest of the structure, you can expect to spend some time figuring out when and where they are using the area. When we look at the larger, more tapered nature of a typical food shelf, it's easy to identify with the fact that you will need a relatively large variety of lure presentations to be successful. Oh, what the heck. You needed another excuse for a few more lures anyway, didn't you? Keep these areas in mind for the first few or the last few hours of daylight. And don't overlook going down to 15 or so feet after midday. The fish use it, and so should you. Vertical breaks are key in deep, clear water rocky areas of the lake, and often exist somewhere on what we are referring to as a classic structure. Fish use these vertical highways simply because they are forced to. The muskie is a cautious, low-light predator, and in a classic clear water system, the only protection she can find might be her deep water sanctuary, and that is where these fast vertical breaks come in. Some of the more rocky areas on structures, such as our classic hotspot, will have very few submerged aquatic plants, due in part to the lack of suitable soil and other reasons. In this case, you can expect the mighty muskie to adhere to the most strictest of rules, be able to reach cover fast, and in this case, cover is simply depth, and fast is vertical. Fish will use or hold on these spots during highlight periods of the day, maintaining a favorable depth depending on the existing light and water temperatures. Once you have concluded this is the muskie's location, they can be caught by presenting any number of bait presentations, such as a deep diving crankbait like the pig from Odyssey, or slow rolling Peterson Tackle's new spinnerbait, or running a slower, possibly deeper running jerkbait such as the Odyssey suspending pig. Nonetheless, this will be a case where versatility and variety will prevail. The key here is deep, and in some cases slow, depending on the attitude of the muskie. I would suggest you parallel your structure and attempt to keep your presentation in the strike zone longer. Fall periods will prove that these areas are some of the best of all possible choices, and there will often be many fish in a very concentrated area along a fast vertical break. For what can be the fastest action during a slow period, learn to fish fast vertical breaks. 
Ah, vegetation. Now we're getting to the root of things. Many facets of a superstructure can attract fish and or bait fish, and some can even hold them temporarily. But nothing will attract and hold like quality vegetated areas, and I can't stress the importance of this factor enough. Every superstructure that has produced the truly big monsters for me has had some form of vegetation. When we examine the potential of a reef or an isolated structure, we get some sort of read on its potential. Add quality vegetation and you can multiply the efficiency factor of that reef by five. If we examine the characteristics or attributes of the vegetation itself, we find the potential to supply needed oxygen to the reef inhabitants. We find cover to attract and support a complete ecosystem from plankton to minnows to crayfish all the way up the food chain to the largest predators. And we find it will even recycle itself year after year. We said earlier our points were primary contact areas for our structure dwellers, and if there was vegetation on the points, it would act as quality attractors and holders. This is true. Now, add the vegetation to some of our other areas, such as food shelves, or maybe an inside turn, and you start to see the factor times five potential. Not only will our superstructures with vegetation attract more and better quality fish, they'll also offer the angler a greater window of opportunity for success. Cabbage is a hardier, deeper plant than say coontail and will last later into the fall period and is frequently found on the ends of points and inside turns. The deeper the cabbage it seems, the longer the plant life. I've experienced in many cases a type of thin leaf cabbage in shallow saddles on reefs and witnessed its death as early as mid-August. My guess is this is due in part to the elements such as temperature, light, or mineral makeup of the water. Coontail, on the other hand, starts early in the season and usually exhausts itself before summer's end. Bulrushes and spike rushes do not add much oxygen to the system. However, they are a very valuable form of shallow water cover for both prey and predator alike. This type of vegetation can also alert an angler to the unseen presence of soils nice beneath morning, the surface yeah. that will host other forms of vegetation. Yeah, this visual cover. identification will assist you in determining little where little to fish without coming. disturbing the structure. Remember, for, uh, the key here is paying attention to detail, and this is an important detail. Hi everyone, Bob Nasekomer here for Grant Rods. You know, musky fishing's a tough deal, and the job's not done till she's in the bag. Well, how do you do that? It's pretty simple. You need big dog rods from Grant Rods. For your next rod, call them at 847-577-0848. Building custom rods since 1983. The summer sun never sets upon the Alaskan pike of the Yunoko, in the heart of breathtaking Alaska. Evenings will be shared reliving the battles of monster pike. The midnight sun trophy pike hunt is on, aboard the 67-foot luxury houseboat, and you're in command. If you're not, you should be. Contact the Midnight Sun Trophy Pike Adventures by calling 800-440-7453 or email them at mstpa50 at gmail.com. Okay, so we've thrown a lot of stuff at you folks, and to be perfectly honest with you, I wanted to. And the detail that we put in it, well, it's unquestionably authentic. So when you get to Witch Bay, Ask them where the Mesocoma Reef is, and you'll have an idea what to fish. Now, the reason we're here in the first place. I had been on a four-week shooting circuit, and I got a phone call from my general manager back at the office. And he said, a guy by the name of Mike James wants you to go in and shoot a show for some friends at Witch Bay Camp. That would be Stephen Gale. Well, I really didn't have a guest lined up because, quite frankly, I wasn't on, planning on fishing. I was on my way home. But I had given away a trip as part of a fundraiser effort with Muskies Incorporated, and a guy by the name of Chad Hopke won the trip. He sold the most raffle tickets to gain new members into Muskies Inc., and as a result, he had an opportunity to go fishing with me. Now, he had four days. That was the key. Four days to go fishing with me. On day one, we hunted and we searched. I showed him what the lake looked like. I gave him a little bit of a tour, various places we were going to fish. It wasn't a good bite window to start with. We had bright sunny conditions and it was obvious in the amount of fish we were seeing. On day two, 
I pulled them up on a spot, not the spot we're seeing today. And I was pulling back a JP6, and I looked down, and I got this nice fish. It's a solid 50. She's coming in on me. Instead of figure eight in the fish, I took the lure away from the fish and told Chad, who was also throwing a JP6, Chad, fish that fish. So as I turned the boat sideways, Chad made four or five different casts, and he hooked up on it. And he says, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. And I looked back, and I could see his rod was pumping, but... Quite frankly, it wasn't a 50-inch fish. So I watched as this thing thugged and worked its way to the surface. And folks, he had a 35-inch walleye and ate that JP6. So he was pretty happy. <laughs> it wasn't a 50-inch muskie, but it was a pretty nice walleye nonetheless. The next day we got up, we pulled down the lake. He got a 45-incher, and then off another spot of mine, he got a 49 and a half. So in my opinion, I had delivered. He got the biggest walleye of his life, he got the biggest muskie of his life, and I got him on the water out of Witch Bay Camp. I introduced him to Stephen Gale, and we had a good time. So I was going to try to ease my way out of there that evening and prepare myself to go home, try to catch a little rest before heading back out on the road for five weeks. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Chad had nothing to do with that. He said to me, he said, listen, I was told I could fish four days with you. So I kind of chuckled. And I said, you really, you really want to fish four days? You really want to fish another day? I want to fish another day. So I says, tell you what, Chad, tomorrow morning when we get up, we're going to be sitting on the cusp of a major. It's an AM major. Let's take a look at the conditions. If everything looks good, We'll put a half day in, and then we'll put the boat on the trailer, call it a good trip, and everybody can go home from there. And I thought it would be, you know, I was negotiation was over. That was, that was all, um, in my opinion, all I had to do to make them happy. Well, we got up in the morning, and we had, quite frankly, early, and it was pretty bright, sunny skies. But there was a front coming. You could see the front. So we kind of lollygagged around at the dock, kind of burned up a little time, kind of organizing the boat, to be honest with you, doing things that we would do at the end of the day, preparing ourselves for, number one, the major, and number two, for the frontal system to get here. Folks, on the reef, on the very reef that I've showed you, the reef they've named after me, this is what Chad Hopke and I experienced. You would be up in here. That's nice right in there where I just threw. A lot of rock combination with some spike rushes or bull rushes up in there. Sure be nice to find some uh, vegetation on the rocks. It's just been tough. I'm used to fishing where there's weeds. Uh-huh. This is a little different. You got to get used to it. You got to, you know, when you get used to the fact that when, when rock is what is holding them, that's where they're going to be. They don't need anything else with it. I like to use these bulrush areas like this for the forage. You know, the forage will sometimes lock up in there. It's safe for them. And that forage ventures out, it's going to get eaten. Just like my jackpot coming out of there, huh? Exactly. Something's going to eat it. Let's hope. Well, clouds are burning off. Are they? Yeah, look in the west yeah, there. Yeah, that's a pretty good front coming there. question is, which way is it moving? It's moving from east to west. Is it? Well, then we're in good shape.
hang tight now, hang tight. Wow. Get a hand on here. Just hold on. That's a big, big fish. We're into it. That's a big, big fish. I'm just shaking. I really need to. Uh... That's a big fish. That's well over 40 pounds. Okay, now what I want you to do is ease her this way. Okay? Ease her this way. Okay. Oh, yes, we're into a hog here. Okay, settle down. Okay, I gotta get a cutters. Here. Yeah. Ooh. Okay, she's free there. That's nice. Yeah. Okay, we're free. Let me get the hooks out of here. This is a very, very big, 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 big fish. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do, you know how to use my camera? Just kind of sit her down on the water. Just kind of hang on to her there for a second. No, I'm not sure, but uh, I learned quick. Okay. She's, she's good. She's down on the water. She's fine. Okay, there's a, uh, I'm going to get it out here for you. Okay. Hold on to her. Okay, here's what I've got on it, okay? You gotta turn it on, it's on, okay? This is a telephoto and a wide angle. Okay. There's a box inside. It'll Just take it vertically, take it vertically, and make sure the entire fish and everything is in the picture. I'm only gonna have this fish out of the water for a couple of seconds. So I want you to get down, get the shots, and we'll put the fish back. This is a very big fish. This fish is really close to 40 pounds if it isn't 40. Okay, I'm gonna hand you this. Okay, let me get my stuff organized up here. Okay, here's what I'm gonna have to do with this now. That's okay. I'm taking the whole net in. Okay. That's what we came here for, huh? Oh, oh this is a monster fish. It's 54. Okay, I'm gonna set her back, okay? Oh, this is a big fish. That's, that's easy, 40 pound stuff. Oh, easy, yes. This fish is 54 inches. If, if it's an inch. Oh, look at this. Oh, look at the head on this thing. Oh, man, is that a beauty. Isn't that gorgeous? Look at that. Huh? Yeah. And did she eat that jackpot? Oh, she's <sighs> inhaled it. Oh. Pretty fish. Look at her, look at me. She's like, hey Bob, back in here. been waiting to meet you. You're back in here, sweetheart. Oh my God, Bob. This is your spot. Oh, I told you it was. Didn't I told you? I said, this is a big fish spot. And that was a big fish lure that you were repairing this morning. Wow, Bob. Oh, she's 54, at least 54. Oh, good girl. I'm going to leave her set. Here she goes. That is beautiful. Oh. That is simply beautiful. <laughs> so, guys, button down and head up with us. Jim Grack and I, like I said, we're going to put together a group up at Witch Bay August of 2018. I think we're looking at about 18 people right now. And, of course, we know people's plans change. So if we can get 25, 30, 35, 36 people there, well, we'll have a great time. And we will share all the information and knowledge you saw today because, to me, that's what it's all about. It's all about making things work. Let's take a look at Witch Bay for just a second, okay? 
This camp is really, really unique. It offers everything you need. And they have all kinds of different things. I'm telling you, they have a camp fish experience. They have guide professionals that are in camp that work with you. They call it their pro fishing program. And if you're out there, hey, you don't necessarily have to drown yourself in musky fishing. We showed you a show a few weeks ago with walleye out of Witch Bay. So come on up there, bring your musky rods, be prepared uh, to fish some muskies, and hook up with some of their walleye people and go out and challenge some of these big walleyes. You know, I told you about Chad Hopke's 35-inch walleye. Well, I failed to tell you about Matt Thompson and I. Matt Thompson and I were shooting a muskie show in there one day, and we went down with Lindy Tubes, the big Lindy Tubes. We had a 34, a 33 and a half, and a 33 inch walleye while we were tubing for muskies. So I'm telling you, it's a great opportunity to come on up. Their phone number is 807-548-3076. That's 807-548-3076. Call us at simply at uh, uh, fishing sticks here. Uh, email me bob.m at fishingstickstv.com. Get your name, get your registration in with us, and let's get you in part of the group. We'll have a good time. Trust me, it's what it's all about. Um, in my opinion, it doesn't get much better than that. I have shared with you the information you need to go out and catch fish. I've talked about the structural elements, how they pertain, what to look for, how to even find them, and in this case, where to find them. Here's what I'm asking from you. Please do me one favor. It's not much I'm asking for a lot, but if you would, please pass the word. Help us grow. Let your friends know, message them, share, like, and help us promote what we're doing. It is what it is, folks. It's all about fishing. It's all about sharing. It's all about raising everybody's boats on the pond. That being said, this is Bob Macecomer saying thanks, God bless, and we'll see you next week for more fishing sticks right here. Do me a favor. Go kick a little tail. That's what it's all about.